Miami Beach Mayor Dan Gubber has been at the tip of the iceberg and the spear and the call for change to, of the culture of South Beach. He championed this curfew and he joins us now live. Mayor Gelber, good morning. Glad to see you. Good morning. Thanks for having me. All right, uh, Mayor Gelber, let's get to kind of the basic question. Uh, South Beach kind of, we just saw the report. It's very quiet this morning. Uh, people, you know, obeyed, it, it seems, the curfew for the most part, but businesses are angry. They have lost a huge amount of revenue. So there is tranquility, but boy, at what a cost. Is this what you wanted the curfew to achieve? Well, we didn't really, I think, have a choice because um, I don't think you really you can balance revenue against public safety. You know, we were trying very hard to manage spring break, which I think everybody knows is a difficult uh, management challenge. We had over 370 police officers out that day, most in South Beach, most in this area. Uh, but still, we had uh, two consecutive nights of shootings or five people were shot. And we were lucky that, uh, you know, that they weren't, uh, they didn't die. We were lucky that more people weren't shot. We had seized up to that day, a hundred uh, guns. Uh, since then, I think we've uh, seized another 23 uh, when we started the curfew. So, you know, given the fact that this was happening, notwithstanding a huge concentration of police and goodwill ambassadors that we put on the street, we just felt like we had no option other than to stop the status quo from happening because the status quo is resulting in just simply too much danger for our guests. So I don't think we had a choice. And I, I'm sorry that folks are losing money uh, with the post midnight crowd, but really you can't balance revenue, resort taxes against public safety. You know, it's worth it, Mayor, to, to say that Miami Beach government does work year round to try to plan for this and message for this. And boy, deja vu. It seems like we talk about this every big weekend. But yeah. I, I want to really go into the actual order that um, declared a state of emergency. It's kind of three and a half pages of whereas, whereas, whereas. But I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, we can boil this all down to just the headline that too many people overwhelming what is the availability and capability of law enforcement. It, do, well, would I think that it's, be accurate? Do you think I, I think it's, it's that, except remember, not only did we have our cops, we, uh, we had a lot of Metro Dade police there. We had a lot of Florida Highway Patrol. I appreciate the state sending some help. And this happened on Ocean Drive within feet of, of patrolling officers who, were, who rushed into the scene, I, I would say heroically, with bullets uh, uh, firing, not knowing even who was firing the bullets. So, you know, I, I, I that's just not a scenario that our city or any city, frankly, should have to endure. Sure, and I, can. And I, absolutely. So it, it, those of us who are sort of watching this full time and also doing news full time, the first thing a lot of us think about here is if you're going to call a state of emergency for two shootings, putting so many people in danger, putting officers in danger, Boy, a lot of municipalities and cities in South Florida, should they be calling states of emergency for for gun violence? Well, this was a little uh, different than what happens in other places uh, in a few ways. Number one, it wasn't like this happened in a dark alley uh, or it happened, you know, like what happened at Shooters, I think, a couple of weeks ago in Fort Lauderdale, where it was, a, a, you know, a, a fight over, um, you know, a, a girlfriend or something. This was sort of random shooting where uh, in the middle of spring break, with, despite police, people just were so out of control that this was just something that happened. The mix of guns into this has really created a peril. And I, I don't think it's particularly common in other areas. This is a very unique uh, scenario. And I, I want to add something else that's, I think, very important. Our spring break, you know, we didn't recruit it. We don't encourage it. It happens in South Beach. But the area where it happens is a residential community. Uh, literally, Flamingo Park has single-family residences, a multi-family residence. There are two elementary schools in the area where the curfew happened, right there on Washington Avenue and in South of Fifth. There are uh, literally condominiums with people in them on Ocean Drive, and that's a, a unique uh, scenario. You know, people talk about Wynwood. Wynwood really doesn't have that kind of profile. It's really just a commercial area. This area has got so much going on that you can't managing this kind of crowd with guns involved is just something that we couldn't allow to continue. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, Mayor Gelber, <clears throat> a really uh, controversial part of the state of emergency was the reaction from some black leaders in our community. You're certainly aware of it, and you refer to it in the op-ed that you wrote in the Miami Herald on Friday. Uh, one of those leaders, Stephen Hunter Johnson, who just served as the chair of the Miami-Dade uh, Black Affairs Advisory Board, said the only emergency is that black people are on the beach. What is your reaction to that? You know, it's very unfair. It's demonstrably untrue, and I categorically, I categorically reject it. Uh, you know, we were trying to manage this for three weeks without a curfew. And actually, it was, it was relatively tame for those three weeks. But two nights in a row where five people are shot is not, you know, something you can look away from. Five people were shot despite an, a huge concentration of police and goodwill ambassadors, all of our best efforts, all of the county's best efforts. And still, over two nights, five people were shot indiscriminately on Ocean Drive, by people who just had weapons and decided that uh, firing them into a crowd was something they wanted to do oh. for whatever reason. Um, you know, it's if we really wanted a curfew, we you know, and that was why we we did it for racial reasons. We would, would have done it three weeks earlier, uh, but that's not fair because we we're very much trying to manage it. And by the way, I I, I mean, I, all I'm. Those businesses that are being hurt, those are a lot of them are local businesses. I feel terrible for them, but I feel mostly terrible for five people who came here for spring break and as innocent bystanders go, ended up in the hospital uh, with bullet wounds. So it's really unfair to say this was, uh, you can't put a racial uh, lens on this simply because it's obvious we did it the morning after two consecutive nights of shooting. It was obviously based solely and only on behavior and a concern for public safety. So I mean, I don't know how anybody could could look could say otherwise. So let's put a geographical perspective on this. The stats show, and, and we don't have them fully for this week yet, but compared to last week, it's uh, last year. Excuse me. It is on track this year to match more than half of the crime perpetrated by people who live in Miami-Dade County, not the visitors who come from spring break, not the people, the kids from colleges who spend money, whatever money they have or can, but the people who come and take advantage of the crowds and the parties and the crazy from the, I, I guess we call them the causeway crossers, who come and perpetrate crime. And in fact, one of, one of the people arrested in one of the shootings is from Hialeah. So does that kind of geography and criminal data change the way you can affect policy to protect those coming for spring break? Listen, I'd love to hear an idea that we haven't tried about how to protect people, whether they're from, uh, you know, whether they're, whether they're from Westchester, uh, Florida, or Westchester, New York. It doesn't matter to me. We, we have to protect them. And, and it's a good point you make in a sense that it also makes the point that, you know, we're protecting visitors, whether, wherever they're from, Almost never is it a resident who's injured or a resident who's a perpetrator. We are policing a playground of other people. That's what our city does. And we accept that burden because that's sort of the economic model of not just our city, but of the region. It's, it, it is a destination city. Yeah. But that's the problem when you have the kind of a spring break tends to be a very raucous event because it's so young. All the spring breaks have been like that. The ones in Fort Lauderdale and Daytona Beach, they've all been a raucous events that, that the cities that have had them have not wanted them because it's so hard to manage. But now when you put guns into it, it doesn't matter where they're coming from, Glenna, whether they're coming from Hialeah or they're coming, you know, from Philadelphia, it doesn't matter because if they're if they're guns involved, it adds a whole nother challenge for us. And and there's also fighting involved very often. And and a lot of that is just too difficult for a residential community to endure, even with a, an incredible concentration of policing, which well, we have. Yeah, but Mr. Mayor, south south of 23rd Street, uh, it is mainly an entertainment district. Certainly south of 5th Street, there are lots of beautiful big condominiums. It's, it's not really, yes, I lived on Miami Beach above 23rd Street. I love living on the beach. Look, you know, here's, here's the point I'd, I'd like to make and get you to comment on. Whether they're from Hialeah or from Philadelphia or Chicago, you know, we have heard most of these kids come. They've told our reporters, other reporters this week, hey, it's spring break. Anything goes on Miami Beach. I mean, they bring that attitude yeah. to Miami Beach. So how do you stop that? 
Well, that's exactly what is. That's why we don't want spring break. I mean, people, you know, act like as it's somehow this is just like all the other events. It's not. It's a young, raucous event. And 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 you are a hundred percent right, Mike. Uh, they come here with an idea that they, you know, and it was like that in Fort Lauderdale, you know, where anything goes. It's a rite of passage, is what it is for a lot of uh, a, a lot of young people. And I understand that, except that. Uh, you know, it is a residential area. Flamingo Park is 100% res residential, that community. Uh, south of it is overwhelmingly residential, that community. And even uh, on Ocean Drive, we have condominiums with yeah. a lot of residents there. And of course, Collins Park does as well. So all these areas have residents there, and yet it's a rite of passage for other people. And I always say, when someone says, uh, you know, Dan, you have to understand it's a rite of passage for people. And I, my response is always the same. Do you want a rite of passage on your, on your front yard? Do you want the, the noise and the, and the drunkenness and then the, uh, the cascading to uh, fighting and then gunplay? I mean, none of that is really acceptable. And we don't want it. We, we try to manage it the best we can. We've tried a lot of different ideas to manage it. But the truth of the matter is that it's just hard because People keep coming here, notwithstanding. You, um, you, Mayor, have been very clear on your intention and your desire to change the culture of the visitors to South Beach. That's something we want to talk about after this quick commercial break. Speaking. Sure. Let's leave that. We are back with Miami Beach Mayor Dan Gelbert talking about the spring break state of emergency. And Mayor, we were talking about a longer term sort of 30,000 feet plan to yeah. change the whole culture, uh, get rid of the entertainment district. That kind of went public in a very awkward way a couple of months ago when these audio tapes from a meeting that you had attended with some developers, former Miami Beach Mayor Philip Levine, uh, where he solicited donations from people with money to donate to candidates that they could pull the controls with and get things done. You told them that uh, whatever government needs, you would provide, update that effort for us. Well, I've been saying this uh, in not just that meeting, everywhere I, I can find people who will listen, that we need to get rid of our entertainment only district. Uh, you know. We're not the Miami Beach of 20 or 30 years ago where we needed to only have uh, all night parties in order to you know, attract people here. We have an incredible art and culture scene, large part because of the ballet, the New World, the, the Bass, Art Basel, Food and Wine, all these things have, have come to our city. Uh, and of course, just over our border is another critical mass uh, near the arch of, of, of art and culture. So to me, we have sold ourselves short because we have this entertainment only district when we offer so much more in terms of historic architecture, beautiful weather, beaches. So I don't know why we feel like that's what we should be doing. So I've been encouraging investment in this area with a view that it ought to, instead of just you know bars all night long, that we have boutique offices, uh, commercial residential galleries, shops, because I think that's the destination we should be. And we've made some progress towards that, by the way. There are a lot of those investments are coming to our city. And in fact, I, we put ordinances out and we have some more percolating, which I think would encourage that. It's not gonna happen overnight, but that is what I think is the reimagination of the entertainment district as an art deco, a true art deco cultural district. And I think that would, um, would handle a lot of our issues. So instead of a Collins Avenue with just Airbnbs and uh, tremendous amounts of people you know, looking to party all night and drink those big drinks. And it would be something, you know, there might be offices there, uh, you know, uh, uh, condominiums and other things, galleries, because that's really what I think our city's uh, profile is. And, and, and it's our profile in other places in our city, but certainly not in certain areas of South Beach and certainly not in March in those areas. Have you had, um, when you have these discussions, because the, the profile of the all night partiers and the big drink drinkers right now during spring break is largely a black American audience. Mm -hmm. So when you have those conversations with black leaders, how do they hear that? Well, well first of all, it's I'm not talking about doing it in March. I'm talking about doing it 12 months a year so it's you know we have a, 
we have a young crowd. It is in March. It tends to be a highly African American. That's true. But it's you know it's it's a pretty diverse crowd throughout the year. But I but for me, I think what we need to do is to be the art and culture destination that we've become most of the time. And and the entertainment only district just doesn't make any sense anymore. You know, I how do people hear that? I hope they hear it this way, and that is that uh, this is a commercial mixed use area, as I talked about earlier in the show, and that it doesn't make sense to have an entertainment only district, uh, you know, like to become Bourbon Street on the ocean. It just, that doesn't make sense. And I hope people understand why a mixed use com uh, community that has lots of, uh, of residents and schools and churches and synagogues in it doesn't want to be an entertainment only district. So. It's not based on anything other than really the uses uh, of this area and what we want it to be. And that's and it makes so much sense, by the way. And and by the way, I suspect if it is reimagined, it's going to have an incredibly diverse uh, attendance. People are uh, of all types of people want to be there. And that's exactly what we want. It is true. Younger people have been a problem during spring break, but that's not race based, obviously, because every Every city in Florida that's had a spring break has tried to stop the spring break because the age of people coming to make a statement uh, and, and have their rite of passage in your community just doesn't make sense for the community. So that's not obviously uh, a racial, but we need we need a, a more of a cultural district. And I think we can do it and we're starting to do it, but it will take time. Mayor Dan Gilber, always good to speak with you. Thank you. I know this Thank has you. been a difficult period for you in the city. Hope you get through it uh, safely. Thank you, and let's go, Canes. <laughs> okay, Thanks, we agree with you there. <laughs> <laughs>